Hey, what's up? Welcome to the Future of Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ellis Hamm. We've got a pretty exciting show for you today. Adam Lack is our guest. He is an experienced real estate investor, but in 2016, like so many of us, caught the crypto bug, and in 2020, began to focus his efforts there, started Cloud Fire Capital and the CFC Bitcoin Fund. In his words, in an effort to provide traditional accredited retail investors a safe, secure, and actively managed option to gain real exposure to the digital asset investment space. Pretty cool episode is uh, just hearing from him, how he allocates his portfolio between real estate and Bitcoin, how he sees crypto impacting the real estate industry, blockchain technology. So rather you're a crypto investor or a real estate investor, I think you're really, really uh, going to enjoy this podcast. Let's get into the show. Adam, man, what's up? Welcome to the show, dude. Thanks for having me, Ellis. Hey, so I got a here, here's my first question. I, you guys, Adam's killing it, uh, but he, and I, I love this. I love having you on here because you have the real estate background, and of course now you have a, a crypto fund as well. But 2016, it says you know you in your bio you said that you were mostly mainly focused on on real estate, but then as crypto was on a rise, you kind of you, you went elsewhere. You pivoted. I'm yeah. curious though, man, because that was around the time. It's probably a little bit before I I started really investing, especially in real estate. And at that time, all I heard from the real estate crowd was, you know, Bitcoin was starting to kind of make its its mark, but it was ah, that's speculative. Don't do that. That doesn't, you know, who who knows where that's gonna go. But you did the opposite, man. You really went for it. Why? What about your background ha caused you to have an open mind when everyone else was saying, don't do it? Talk to me. I mean, yeah, I, I think we're, I mean, honestly, I think we've come full circle again. We're back at the point now where kind of Bitcoin is decreasing in value. And I think, you know, the chatter is starting to make the rounds as far as are we entering this prolonged bear market that we saw in 2000, 2018 and beyond. Uh, I think it's a little too early to tell, but, but no, you're, you're right. I, I was a real estate guy for years. Um, mostly, you know, either rentals or single family homes. Uh, I had a couple partners out here in, in Pittsburgh where we did stuff. Um, as I told you before we started, I, I still have a real estate firm that I'm somewhat active in, but, but it's minimal. Um, 99% of my time goes to cloud fire capital, but yeah, I mean, I had the opportunity to get involved in Bitcoin. I mean, early, like 2000, 2011, 2012-ish, I was approached by somebody I work with about investing. And I, I did the same thing that everybody does. This is stupid. This is speculative. This is magic, internet money. This is never going to go anywhere. So it did, you know, so I started going down that rabbit hole then by 2015, 16, I was heavily invested personally, you know, in Bitcoin uh, and the like. So at that point, I was so heavily invested from a from a personal standpoint that I had started kind of allocating a, a large majority of my net worth into Bitcoin, which was obviously the right move. I lucked out in 2017 when we hit when we hit that macro top and we topped out at twenty thousand. I knew there was no way the market could sustain that, just given the participants and the fact that no institutions were really kind of coming in the door yet. And there was this just euphoric sense coming out of retail, like we're going to go to 100,000. So I, I was fortunate in that I was able to back out. You know, the rest is history. It came all the way back down from 20,000. Uh, I re-entered. And then at that point, you know, I had some people around me who were also heavily involved in, in crypto. And, and I hate using the word crypto for Bitcoin because I do think they're two different things. So heavily involved in Bitcoin and crypto. Um, and then around 2018, we started kind of, you know, discussing outwardly how, how could we structure, how could we work with Bitcoin? How could we make that something that we do on a full time basis? Um, you know, being that that we're so heavily involved and interested in it. Uh, and, and that's kind of how the idea of Cloudfire Capital came to be. We started seeding the fund in 2019 and early 2020. We locked out with the March 2020 crash. 
uh, which allowed us to really scoop up, you know, some Bitcoin for for some pretty good prices. And then uh, from there, we know everything was pretty much straight up coming out of March 2020 with the Fed pumping money into the economy and everything. Now, the market structure is obviously changing as we head into 2022. I think we're going to see a very less forgiving uh, market environment, both in traditional legacy markets and Bitcoin and crypto. But uh, there's still opportunity there. There's still money to be made. And uh, we've just kind of extrapolated on what we started building in 2019 and 2020. We now have a, a mining operation that we do on site. We're, we're building that out. We're adding miners on, onto what we presently have. Um, and then we're in talks to offer kind of a custody solution because one of one of our partners is a cyber security a military grade cyber security firm so we have the infrastructure and the oversight in place makes sense for us to do that so we're just building on top of you know kind of what we started with the fund so let me ask you this then man because this is a real estate show but we talk about crypto and bitcoin and blockchain and uh, because it is the future of real estate like it is the future right. of everything in some ways right i mean regardless of what we're seeing right now uh so let, let, i want to dive into that a little bit my first question is this do you see investing in bitcoin or blockchain technology or i just want to talk about let's just say bitcoin for example right now and real estate is like the perfect barbell strategy and you know what i mean by barbell where you know real estate clearly is a predictable conservative asset we don't invest in real estate to 10x our investment but we do invest in bitcoin in some ways to 10x our investment so do you see like how do you as an investor someone who has a background in real estate and now in crypto do, do you do you still think about having real estate kind of as a barbell approach to kind of help stabilize what you're doing in Bitcoin? Or are you just all in there? Tell me your approach and what you think about for maybe even an average investor listening to the show is both of these assets combined make make a decent approach and how they structure a portfolio. Give me your thoughts. I mean, I think they do. I think you need to be, I think real estate is a no brainer. Obviously, I we still have real estate investments. I actually just exited a real estate investment earlier this year so that we could allocate that capital into our mining operation. So pretty much everything I do uh, or, or have or have had goes back into the business at this point, uh, which is fine because I, I want to see it grow and I want to I want to get it to a sustainable point. But I, I think you're exactly right. I think real estate and Bitcoin are important. And there's so much there's so many other projects out there when we're talking about the Bitcoin space, whether we're talking about altcoins or NFTs or you know, uh, metaverse plays. I mean, there's just so much out there. It's getting to the point where supply is uh, more than demand. And I think a lot, you know, over the next year here, we're going to see a lot of these projects kind of, you know, trend to zero because that's typically what happens when the market's oversaturated. That said, you have these blue chip assets like Bitcoin, where you know, is the price down right now? Is it struggling? Sure. Yeah. With with what's going on, um, kind of from a macro perspective with the Federal Reserve and central banks, um, you know, Kazakhstan just collapsed that they, they held a fairly significant amount of Bitcoin's ha mining hash rate was was in Kazakhstan. I'm getting reports that it was, you know, even approaching 20 percent. So with Internet outages there and everything that affects the network, obviously. But by nature, Bitcoin is anti-fragile. It, it is. It always like rises from the ashes like a phoenix every single time. It's done it time and time again over the past what 13 years, and it will continue to do it. So I feel like I feel like it makes the most sense at this point, you know, to to be invested in real estate, kind of a, a, a your safe um your safe legacy play that that you know you have a real tangible asset there to kind of it allows you right to to sleep at night in some ways knowing that my bitcoin portfolio took a pretty big hit these last right. two weeks you know what i'm saying i'm probably still exactly net positive right. but i'm like man I, that that hurt you know watching it this. does it does and i always i'm always super upfront with our investors 
And like I told you, I mean, we, we accept accredited investors. So we're not out there accepting great aunt Louise, who's 89 right. years old, living on a fixed income. We're, we're only, you know, accepting accredited investors. Smart. So whether that's a IRA holder, whether that's a traditional capital, whether that's a business, we have some businesses in the fund. So it doesn't really matter from that standpoint, but what we're looking for, you know, qualified investors. And I feel like, you know, you have to be upfront about that. Like, the days of uh, these 100x gains, the, they're getting more and more behind us. And while there will be one-off exceptions where there will be a project that does you know, a 2,000% gain in a matter of weeks, that's becoming um, the exception, not the rule. So at this point, if you're looking for that, th this probably, you know, Bitcoin probably isn't that, but what it is, what it is, is really, you know, kind of a call option on the future of uh, the global financial system, the legacy financial systems that we've had in place for how many decades, because something's wrong. I mean, something's wrong. Let's be honest. What do you see that's wrong in it, man? Because I'm in financial world all the time. What I see, first of all, is things are slow. Like it is amazing how slow it is to move money. I mean, we syndicate deals, we raise capital. The fact that we are still at the speed of traditional banks and have to, it's unbelievably slow and it still kind of feels scary. Like, oh, I don't know where my money is or I, am I sending it to the right place? What and else do you on, see? And then on top of that, what I see is I see European countries turning away customers who don't have a vaccine passport from withdrawing their money out of the bank. That's what I see. Wow. I've, I've seen those videos circulating and that's just repugnant. And I see, you know, like you said, outdated payment rails where we're wiring money and it's taking three, four, five business days to get right. to the destination. I sent Bitcoin to one of our consultants the other day. He had it in three minutes. Yeah. I mean, why, why do we need to keep doing kind of the same thing that's clearly been broken? And then also, I'm sure you've noticed we've had all these different banks, like you have a main bank in your area and it'll have like four different branches. They're starting to shut them down because nobody's coming in and they can't keep employees. So it's only a matter of time before we kind of go, go the way of, um, you know, I hesitate to say like the Bitcoin lightning network because I don't quite think we're there yet, but we will go the way of, you know, payment via cryptocurrency, payment via Bitcoin. Um, now, what the whether or not the Federal Reserve comes out with their own, you know, their own um, kind of CBDC or central bank digital currency, I'm sure they will over the next several years. Uh, but again, that's something that's centralized. That's something they can monitor. That's something they can control. Bitcoin is not. I mean, Bitcoin is what it is. It exists as it exists since 2009, uh, when the first block was mined. And it's not going to change. The parameters are not going to change. It just is what it is. And I feel like it's important, especially where kind of global society is headed. It's important to have something to fall back on, to have somewhere to put your capital. I have a large portion of my own capital in bitcoin and yeah it's volatile and yes it sucks watching you know your portfolio go from here to here in in six days but at the same time it always bounces back up i don't need that money right now it always comes back up right. which is um, important to know again that's why i tell you know even with real estate though i mean typically it's uh it's not as volatile but it is illiquid and that's why i always tell investors right like don't give me what you need next year let me ask you this man in terms of the uses of Bitcoin for real estate, or maybe this is the question really might even be blockchain, but you know, we, we kind of got to explain maybe what those things are. But I guess my question is again, we both see Bitcoin as an incredible storage of value, but is there, I think a lot of people are like, well, what's the use though? Like what, what, I mean, I can't, I don't want to, I can't actually buy anything with Bitcoin because why would you spend uh, $60,000 to go buy a Tesla with one Bitcoin if Bitcoin is going to go up, you know, two or three X in the future. So what is the real use of it for the everyday investor? Like that might be listening to this show. 
my opinion, and I hear you there, and I think the entire time, so obviously, as we know, Tesla stopped accepting Bitcoin um, for purchases back in May, and they have not restarted that program. From what I was told, they had sold one, one Tesla for Bitcoin in the time that they accepted it. Nobody wants to spend their money on a Tesla. It's unnecessary, and it's kind of ridiculous, to be honest. However, there's countries out there, I don't know, maybe Venezuela would be a better example, but these people have no, their, their cash is worthless. Right. So, so where do you put, like, how do you store your monetary energy? Because that's what Bitcoin is, right? I, in my opinion, it's the, like I said, we mine Bitcoin. It's the purest form of, of converted monetary energy i'm taking we are taking electricity we are taking energy and we're converting it you know via the process of mining and and then we're converting it into bitcoin to store the value and again yes bitcoin's down today or this week but you know let's talk about 2024 when bitcoin halves again where does it go you know historically it goes up pretty significantly following the halving. So I feel like from a use case, from a, a utility perspective, Bitcoin could be, I'm not going to sit here and say, Bitcoin's going to become the world reserve currency and every every central bank around the world is going to have to you know get on board with that. I'm not going to sit here and say that, but what I do think it could be useful for, you know, if, if you're in per Portugal, and you're ordering $300 million of deep sea drilling equipment from another country, why not pay for that in Bitcoin? Why couldn't Bitcoin? Same with commodities. Russia, Russia is currently engaging in things where the penalty for that would be, what, cut off from the legacy, legacy financial system? Use Bitcoin. You could you know, kind of do all the same things. So I think there are use cases out there. I just don't want to get ahead of myself and say, yeah, it's going to be a world reserve currency or something like that. But but the use cases are there and the need is there. This was a very um, intuitive quote that I heard years ago. Somebody said, when Bitcoin was created, it was a solution in need of a problem. And I feel like over the past 24 months, we've been presented with that problem. And that problem is government, central banking. Um, you know, kind of the subsequent fall of some countries that we're probably going to see, and they're going to need some type of store of value that is globally recognized. Yeah, no, that, that's excellent. That's excellent. Excellently put. But let, let me ask you this. So a lot of folks, you know, we just start talking, there's a lot of talk in our industry right now about the blockchain and blockchain technology. Bitcoin is not, explain to me or explain to our audience, like, what is do you have to be on the do you have to own bitcoin do you have to even use bitcoin for the blockchain and why do you think the blockchain is so disruptive let's just even talk about to the real estate industry man do you, i mean do you think it's going to be a, a huge disruptor for our industry and why i do i i think it i think it has a place uh in real estate and almost every other investment uh investment space when we're talking about blockchain and we're talking about Bitcoin, we are really talking about two separate things. I wouldn't use them interchangeably. Uh, you know, although Bitcoin operates over, um, you know, what people would refer to as a blockchain, a, a distributed ledger. Right. Um, so when we're mining Bitcoin, we are, we are, you know, transacting on that blockchain and then every past transaction from that blockchain is kind of on all these all these nodes, all these computers all over the world. There are ways where, or there are there are items where a blockchain could be very useful. And I know people, you know, and I'm sure you do too, who are who are conducting real estate offerings using a blockchain now. It may not be Bitcoin's blockchain. It may be another alternative cryptocurrency. Um, maybe they chose it because of their speed or their security. Uh, you know, each one of these projects has kind of different pros and cons to it. 
depending on kind of what you're looking for. Uh, but I do see that. I do see real estate tokenization, quote unquote, taking place where it kind of takes place on the blockchain. Dividends are paid out on the blockchain. I also see it in other industry. We're born, we get a birth certificate, we get a social security card, we get driver's licenses. Those are all, those are all kind of state documents that could be transferred over to some sort of blockchain. Now, when you say that, then you get into, uh, you, you know, you inevitably get into the decentralization versus centralization aspect of everything. I mean, obviously a tokenized real estate offering is going to be centralized, right? And I think, you know, the, the important aspect of Bitcoin that a lot of people forget about a lot of the time, especially with 20,000 different projects out there is Bitcoin is truly decentralized. There is no operating team. We can't just shut it down just because uh, there's too many transactions going on. There's an issue with it. So I do think I do think it has a future in real estate 100%. I, I don't think it's fine tuned yet. I think that needs to happen. And I think people need to experiment. But but I do know some people personally that are you know, doing some very interesting things with tokenizing real estate offerings. And I, well, and I is, is there an industry that's already ahead of the curve, man, like that has already kind of accepted this blockchain technology? Like, wh what industry is ahead that you that you see? Not necessarily. I, I don't think so. I feel like people I feel like right now with all the uncertainty out there floating around and kind of this uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, you know, becoming more hawkish on monetary policy coming into 2022, that's create creating a lot of uncertainty in the markets. And then you have uh, re regulatory ambiguity. And a lot of these institutions are kind of backing off because they're not sure what direction that's going to go. But what I am starting to see, what I am starting to see in the in this space is kind of uh, compartmentalizing or breaking it down into sectors as if, you know, we're looking at the traditional legacy market, the, the stock market, where we have, um, you know, kind of uh, legacy stocks and value plays and big tech and, you know, all of those different sectors. I'm starting to see that in cryptocurrency and bitcoin where you have kind of your your blue chip almost legacy assets and then you have your metaverse plays and then you have your right. DeFi, and then you have your l1 you know what i mean so it keeps going and going and going right. but as far as you know a certain industry being ahead of the curve unless you're thinking of something that i'm not thinking of i can't think of it no anything. i'm really not I, i'm curious just because I, I just think i'm wondering and again that's why we created this show is I, i'd like to be one of the early adopters is i i don't think we're going to get away from blockchain technology we're certainly not going to get away from cryptocurrency and i do think the more we can become comfortable with this and the more people who are working towards making it more secure and getting rid of the stuff, the fraud, the spam, the, the things that are happening there, then we can begin to adopt it and actually use it. And I mean, I think about this, the uses of it in real estate, right? Where we can have, I mean, think about how hard it is, right? The biggest things about real estate right now, the biggest drawbacks about investing in it is one, you really don't know how much you're, it's worth at why you're holding it until you sell it, you know, like you could hold it for forever, but how much, you don't know what your net worth is. The other thing is just illiquid. I think the blockchain can solve both of those issues. We can have a current net asset value and we can make it liquid because we can tokenize it. Right. And I think that's, you had mentioned that earlier, the illiquid aspect of real estate. And I, and I do think that's, you know, like I said, we had sold a piece of real estate this year to kind of finance our mining operation. And that was a process. I mean, that was a multi-month process to find a buyer, to go through the you know, the inspections to go through the closing, to go through settlement. I mean, if somebody can shorten that process and you could flip that real estate as if I'm selling you or, or sending you Bitcoin, that would be something. That would be something. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's, it's, we're, we're so early, man. We're, we're so, so early. Um, let me ask you this. I have a question just about Bitcoin. And then let's, I want to ask you another real estate question. What happens when I sell my Bitcoin? Do you actually, like, now that you've bought and set, traded a lot, what it, are people who are holding Bitcoin, 
you know, I mean, make the case of, and I think that's why a lot of folks, maybe in my world say, you know, real estate is a better asset to hold long term because of, you know, what happens when you sell Bitcoin. What is the trade off, man, of holding and, and then if you go to sell Bitcoin? Uh, I have to look at it from two different perspectives. I'm looking at it from my personal investment portfolio, and then I'm also looking at it from our managed you know, a professionally managed pooled investment vehicle. And obviously, sometimes I'm going to have uh, diverging, diverging uh, agendas there, sure. because Makes sense. sometimes, or most of the time when I'm purchasing Bitcoin, it's for the long term, I'm locking it away in cold storage, I'm not reintroducing it to them, it's gone, it's off the market. You know, I'd like to pass it on to my daughter or something. When we're talking about, you know, a you know, a fund where we have to be attentive to quarterly and annual returns and whatnot. Uh, it's a little bit different. And in 2021, we had a lot of volatility, a lot of volatility, and it gave us an opportunity to try out some different strategies and do some different things. And we've been able to narrow down, you know, uh, this is how we want to attack the markets. This is the strategy that we want, want to use because this has, you know, performed best for us. So when we're doing that, we're, we're probably rotating out of, of long-term Bitcoin positions more often than I would ever like to do. When, when I had initially built the fund or when we had initially built the fund, the idea was to kind of accumulate as much Bitcoin as humanly possible. And that was a good strategy, uh, you know, on top of, of, you know, generating performance above and beyond the market. That was a good strategy in 2020 and early 2021. It is not now. It is not, you know, that's not a strategy that you could really use for a professionally managed vehicle unless you're talking like a trust where, you know, it's just kind of a one-way door. So, you know, at this point, we're looking to kind of quote unquote, play the ranges that we see in front of us. Like, yes, we would like to see Bitcoin at hundred thousand dollars. That's not happening. It doesn't matter what we want or what we think we need to play what, what is happening in the market. And I, and I think we've really built, started building the fund around a strategy. That's kind of the best for us. Um, but as far as selling it, I, I really dislike that. Like I really dislike relinquishing Bitcoin that has been purchased because I do, I do think in the next three, four, five, ten years, the value is just going to be. I but mean, I it, if, if I hold Bitcoin for longer than a year, is it taxed as capital? Like as a, is it would be taxed if I hold a real estate deal for over yeah, a year? Yeah, typically twelve months is long term. So if you're if you've held it for twelve months and then you sell it, typically that is uh, that's then considered you know long term capital gains as opposed to short. Um, you know, really any transaction, this is what kills me about the, uh, using Bitcoin for purchases right now. Cause in the U S if you use your Bitcoin to purchase something, that's a taxable event, right? So if you're using your Bitcoin that you bought at $10,000 and buying a $60,000 Tesla with it, you're paying tax. You you're going to get hit on the difference between what you paid and what, what it was worth when you used to buy that, that product. And that's one of those kind of gray area things. And I know the IRS is really kind of ramping up their, um, I don't know, their their agenda against cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and stuff. But, you know, we'll, we'll have to see how that plays out. But yeah, typically over 12 months, long term, under 12 months, short term. And um, obviously, you know, as I tell our investors, your financial situation is kind of between you and your tax professional. We don't give, you know, we don't typically give uh, tax advice. Sure. So as a, as a former current, I shouldn't say former currently re investing in real estate and during exiting out of deals and in Bitcoin, I mean, just speak from a personal perspective, man, you're not giving any financial advice here, but how are you allocating your portfolio? You know, with, do, do you, do you want passive income? Does that what you lean on real estate for? I mean, what are you leaning on real estate for? How much, how much are you in crypto? Just, just give us your, your personal, you know, financial, I guess, thesis. Yeah, over the past five years, I've rotated out a lot out of a large majority of real estate ventures that I was in, either like you know myself and my wife, or jointly with partners. Uh, I I still do maintain like two two larger real estate investments. Everything else is 
either in Bitcoin specifically, or it's in our fund, it's in CFC Bitcoin fund right next to all of our other investors. Because I felt like when we launched the fund, it was important to me that I had a large interest, you know, not only in kind of building the company, but I had a large, large interest in CFC Bitcoin fund as a limited partner, because it was important to me that when people say, is your money in there? It's like, yeah, my money's in there right next to yours. So, you know, when we, you know, have a bad quarter, or, you know, whatever the case, I, I'm suffering the same, you know, as anybody else. And I'm also kind of experiencing the same upside as well. But, but yeah, I would say at this point, and I don't, I wouldn't suggest this probably to most people, but I would say we're greater than 80% in Bitcoin right now. I believe in its anti-fragility. I believe in its ability to kind of continuously turn itself around and come back up. I believe that we will continue to see the behavior, the, the behavior, the price action and behavior we've seen post having every four years as we have in the past you know, 12, 13 years. Um, so I think the risk reward heading into like 2030 is, is a no brainer for yeah. Bitcoin. If you can buy Bitcoin at $40,000 and you have three or four years, I think that's a no brainer because I think you will, there's, there's very few investments that will return most likely what Bitcoin will return in that time. Adam, what about since you own so much Bitcoin, why not leverage that Bitcoin into more cash flowing assets that give you more income. Have you thought of, I mean, I'm sure you've thought about it, but why just put, you say you have most of it in cold storage. I mean, so, the ability to leverage, I mean, for example, we I leveraged just a little bit of our Bitcoin to help with a real estate transaction. And I paid 0% interest because, you know, of the, how they're, you know, where they can pull it together and, and do that. So why, why not do that? So you did that like on an, uh, like on an exchange that offers like, yeah. Yeah, so I'm I'm pretty old school, and it's funny to say old school as relates to Bitcoin. I'm pretty old school <laughs> when it comes to, you know, your personal Bitcoin holdings. I believe they should be offline and in cold storage. I also believe, you know, obviously in in our capacity managing the fund, we review fairly heavily on chain analytics. Um, so so you know, like glass node stuff, anything that's going on with Bitcoin on chain. It's my personal opinion that this Bitcoin balances across all exchanges are being misrepresented. Uh, that's my opinion. I, I don't think that there is as much Bitcoin on exchanges as they claim there is on exchanges. Um, you know, will that ever come to a head or impact retail investors? I don't know, but, uh, but I do think there's a little bit of an issue there. And then you have these exchanges like FDX or Binance where they're overseas and, you know, it's different regulation over there. And we try to be very cautious as far as, again, from a fund standpoint, we try to be very cautious from a personal standpoint. It just makes me feel better to have it locked away off of an exchange where I'm the only one who has access to it. Now, that said, believe me, I've considered, you know, uh, would that be a viable idea to kind of move some Bitcoin and take advantage of it to, to, you know, maybe take a loan and then, you know, purchase uh, an actual tangible asset, like a piece of real estate, whatever. I haven't been in that position where I've had to do that yet, luckily or fortunately. Um, but, but I think it is, I think that's a, probably an okay option for some people. I think you need to be very careful in the amount that you borrow against your Bitcoin and where your kind of, you know, liquidation point right. is and your margin, where you so. expect the price to go. But yeah, um, yeah I, I don't think it's a bad idea at all. I, I feel like we will eventually get to a time where you won't have to sell your Bitcoin. Like, like the owner, like you owning that Bitcoin will allow you to kind of, get the things that you want to get either via, you know, line of credit or loan or whatever, however you want to say it uh, through traditional financial institutions, because I think the value, I think Bitcoin will continue eating into the value of all these other asset classes, gold and real estate and bonds and everything else. 
Adam, you got any uh, any just final predictions, man, before we get out of here on just the future of real estate, uh, asset prices, where we're going? Uh, and, and clearly, you spend most of your time in Bitcoin, but clearly we know that's going to impact every industry, including this one. Any any predictions, man, on just where you see real estate going in the future? Real estate, I mean, valuations are high right now, right? I mean, I'm curious to see what happens in 2022, kind of, you know, with uh, with the, the Fed's pivot and them becoming more hawkish and kind of, you know, talking about, uh, you know, triple rate raise this year and, and starting to taper, whether that's, um, you know, whether that's an actual taper or, or them approaching it a little bit differently and just kind of slowing buying. But, but I am interested to see kind of how that affects real estate. I, I think, you know, you can't go wrong w- with real estate. I think prices are lofty right now. And, and I do think by 2030 that we probably see some type of correction there as far as, you know, bringing, bringing real estate pricing back down to earth. I realize there are certain... Um, certain, you know, parts of real estate that haven't been as impacted by these lofty, you know, kind of overvaluations. Um, but, but I, I do, I'm interested to see kind of how this year plays out because I'm, I'm just, I just feel like everything eventually has to kind of, um, you know, revert back to the mean and, you know, how long does it take for real estate or, or is that, an industry where it is just so desirable and will continue to be that it, it just doesn't for years and years and years. Yeah. So it's interesting, right? Well, I, and I think it's hard to, it's hard to look at history and say, well, you know, real estate has gone in cycles and I still believe there's cycles to this, but also new things are introduced with each cycle. Now we're more globalized and have more globalization of capital and now we have cryptocurrency and a blockchain that brings everyone together faster than ever so real quick do you see any like uh impact from the whole Evergrande situation in china kind of bleeding over into the u.s and and kind of real estate um real estate investment firms in the u.s do you see that happening I, I mean, it's such a different level. Like there's so, you know, there, there's so many levels to this real estate game too, as I'm sure there are in crypto, like, and we're probably more at a retail level than an institutional level. I, I don't, I mean, I read a ton of reports from some of the largest REITs in the country and I, I don't see an impact there yet. Um, it, it will be, it will be curious to see, but um, I mean, I definitely hear more of more foreign money coming in every, every day. I mean, I, I think it has to do with, why cap rates are so compressed because, you know, I mean, you look at Japan where you have, you know, zero to negative interest rates. I mean, even at a three or four cap rate to own, I mean, even a two cap rate or one cap rate, which we're not there yet in large commercial real estate, but that would still be a better investment than sitting at zero. You're, you're might be getting 1% yield, but you're in an appreciating asset and right. arguably, the best economic country in the world all right you know what i mean or at least with the most promise in terms of stability so it's interesting man we'll see i i, I don't i think 22 2022 is still a little young i think it'll be a great year across the board on most assets i think 2025 you know will be will be really interesting <laughs> yeah yeah i'm interested to see how everything plays out this year i mean we've had a good you know first week of the year and i you know despite the uh ugly markets and you know we'll see how far they're willing to go with this kind of uh you know this this you know fed pivot i i don't think they're going to i don't think they're going to be able to take it real far that's my opinion and so i think we will kind of you know head back to some more um positive you know, market behaviors, but it, it may take some time here. Cloudfire Capital, man, what, what, what do people need to know? Where do they need to go? Yeah, uh, everything you would need is on our website. It's cloudfirecapital.com. So there's even a, a form there that you can fill out and submit to us if you're interested in obtaining more information. Uh, other than that, I mean, you know, we're on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, we're on Instagram, so you know we're all over the place. And I gotta uh, follow you on Twitter, man. What's your Twitter? It's at Cloudfire Cap. 
Oh, so you still got the the you, you don't have a, a personal man. I see, I see, I see. Well, that is the... my that is my personal and business. I'm not a huge social media guy, but I there really it is. Like I see it. I'm following you right now. Eighty, yeah, yeah. Come on, man. I, I'm 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 new on Twitter, but I'm telling you, man. I, I think Twitter honest. is the is the is the wave, man. I'm I'm trying to ride honest. it. Like, Ellis, I have to be honest. Sometimes, like, I'll monitor Twitter for sentiment. You know, sentiment in the markets and see what people are saying and stuff. Some of the stuff that comes out of people's mouths now is like, I have to stop for a second and I'm like, why would you publicly say that? That's so bizarre. Like, it's such a bizarre thing to say. And I feel like that, you know, that's kind of the real problem going on is, is uh, you know, I would say in a form, you know, in a way is, is mental illness, unfortunately. Mm. So I think social media has kind of perpetuated that, especially in young people who didn't, yeah didn't grow up a, a different way. I remember a time without, without a whole lot of social media and cell phones and some people don't. So no, but I think, yeah, right yeah. To, uh, hit me up on, on Twitter and, and, you know, what, like I said, we're going to start doing, I think we're going to start doing a Twitter spaces there uh, at some point this month. Yeah. So. I'm on it. I, I follow them. Uh, guys, make sure you go follow Adam, Adam there. I'm sure if you search your name too, you can, uh, you can show up. Uh, well, let's 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 get his his Twitter his Twitter following. It. Clearly, this is a guy you need to be following, man. So, yeah. a guy who who knows real estate and is in crypto, dude. I appreciate this, man. Love having you on. Looking forward to uh, seeing how how you guys grow and how we can collaborate in the future. Yeah, awesome. I really appreciate you having me on, Ellis. I had a great time. So, thank you so much. All right, man. Appreciate you. We'll see you. See ya.